Kofi Awuno was originally known as George Awuno Williams. He was born to an Ewe family in 1935. He is a Ghanaian poet and novelist. He was educated at the Atumota School and the University of Ghana, Lagos. He studied as well in the University College of London and a few years after in the United States. He published collections of poems, namely Rediscovery and Other Poems in 1964. Night of My Blood in 1971. He was an influential figure in Kwame Nkrumah's government and later became Ghana's ambassador to Brazil. He died in 2013 in the Kenyan shopping mall disaster when the supermarket was bombed by suspected Somali terrorists. Kofi Awuno's Weaver Bird tells the story of a bird which was warmly welcomed by its host. The host showed their kindness and humility by risking their only tree for the weaver bed just to make sure it was comfortable. Not only did they free this bed in a special way, they equally supervised the egg laying process of this bed. But what did they get in return? We find a dramatic twist of events when the weaver bed, after feeling comfortable, unravels its ulterior motive for coming to build its nest in the speaker's only tree. It is expected that with the kindness and love shown to this bird, the weaver bird will reciprocate this by equally being good and genuine to the owner of the house. But this is not so. On a more literal meaning, Kofi Awuno's weaver bird tells the story of colonization and how the whites wanted to take over the African continent after they were warmly welcomed by the people of Africa. It is clear from all indication that the hospitality of Africans paved the way for this marginalization and dehumanizing arts. Kofi Awuno takes readers of the poem to the post-colonial period or era and delves deep into the negative effects of colonization on the African continent. While some people are of the view that the coming of the Europeans to Africa brought hope to many as it marked the end of certain obnoxious laws in human practices and also introduce education and monetary system. Some on the other hand believe that the coming of the Europeans to Africa marked the rejection of the African culture and religion and this is what Kofi Awuna does not agree to. He does not agree to the total rejection of the African religious belief in favor of Christianity and modernity. He practically and intellectually rejected this assertion through his philosophical poem, The Weaver Bird. It is true that the Europeans came to Africa with ulterior motives. However, Africans realized too late the fakeness, hypocrisy, and deception of the colonial masters as they had an ulterior motive for coming to the African continent and not necessarily to preach the gospel and win more souls for Christ. Let's start our analysis of the poem with the title, the Weaver Bird. Kofi Awuno uses several symbols in this poem, and one of them is the Weaver Bird. The Weaver Bird in this poem refers to the Europeans who came to settle in Africa and how the colonizers established themselves in the African continent. It is important to note that the poem is not in any way talking about birds. However, the bird is used as a symbol of the colonialists who came to the African continent. The weaver bird built in our houses and laid its egg on our only tree. We did not want to send it away. We watched the building of the nest and supervised the egg laying. The first five lines of the poem informs us of the coming of Europeans to Africa. Even though the weaver bird or the Europeans were not invited into the African continent, the people warmly welcomed them and treated them in a very special way. Here, Kofi Awuno uses some symbols. As we said earlier, the weaver bird represents the Europeans or the wise men. Just as the bird was not invited by the people, the same way the whites were not invited into Africa. However, their arrival was not met with hostility. What the poet tries to inform us here is that just as the bird flew from his home to come and settle on the speaker's only tree, 
The same way the whites traveled a long way from their foreign lands to come and settle in Africa. The use of the word our houses makes reference to the African continent. Again, our only tree and this line means that our only country or our only continent. Nest in this line has to do with the building of the white man's colony and the European invasion on the African continent. The X refers to the extension of the white man's colony. Here, it is important to notice that the poet used the plural form of egg, which is X, to symbolize or represent the extension of the white man's colony, that is, their administration, laws, power, culture, and religion. It is important to note that the activities of the weaver bird or the white man were masterfully and tactically carried out under the guise of religion. Hence, the people of Africa were left with no other option than to watch the building of the nest and supervise the egg laying process. These lines reveal the innocence of the Africans and how they warmly welcome a stranger into their land, risking their only country or continent in an attempt to show their hospitality and humility. With humility and hospitality on their mind, none of them could foresee the repercussion of the entry of the white man into the African continent. Not only did they settle in Africa, or not only did the white man settle in Africa, they were determined to spread their administration and religion. And by so doing, they crushed the indigenous tradition and culture of the people of Africa. And the weaver bird returned in the guise of the owner, preaching salvation to us that own the house. They say it came from the west, where the storms at sea had felled the gulf, and the fishes dried their nests by lantern lights. In these lines, the speaker reveals to us that the wives, who were once strangers of the land, have finally come back to the host or to the African continent, claiming that Africa belonged to them. Here, the speaker reveals the hypocrisy of the Europeans who had the audacity to preach salvation after doing the exact opposite of salvation and other religious messages they preached. This line takes our mind back to the partitioning of Africa where there was a mad rush for the African continent. This was when the Europeans divided the African continent Therefore, they came back telling us that the African continent belongs to them. The Europeans came back giving the impression that everything African was paganism. Hence, there was a need for salvation. Here, Kofi Awuno informs readers of the poem of how the whites succeeded in gradually wearing away the African culture and religion, the religious images preaching salvation salvation is a word frequently used by christian priests and their followers inasmuch as the europeans try to forcefully assimilate africans they are treated with scorn since they are the owners of the house and they equally have their own religion the use of the words in the guise of the owner discusses the ingratitude displayed by the white man who after being offered a temporal place to stay now begins to claim ownership of the African continent. And indeed, the Europeans first came to Africa for exploration. As time went on, they came to trade. They displayed their true identity by claiming ownership of the place which was given to them for temporary use. Instead of staying temporary in the tree offered to them by the Africans, these Europeans overstayed their welcome and settled permanently. They established schools and preached Christianity. As if that was not enough, they went on to exploit the natural resources of Africa, leaving Africans with nothing. It is clear from all indication that the weaver bird has established themselves fully in another man's country. A sermon is the divination of ourselves and our new horizon limits as its nest but we cannot join the prayers and answers of the communicants. We look for new homes every day, for new altars. We strive to rebuild the old shrine, 
deferred by the weaver's excrement. The speaker in this line poses as a defender of the African traditional religion and gives reasons as to why Africans can't and shouldn't join their prayer, since that of the African religion is simple and straightforward. Again, a tone of bitterness and anger is brought out by the use of the word excrement, which shows that the Africans do not consider the waste falls on them by the West or by the white man as superior. The poetic speaker in this line claims that his old and Asian culture has been tainted by the weaver bears as Oswald Brisini Mashali was born in 1940 in Verhid in the KwaZulu Natal province of South Africa. At the age of 18, he traveled to Johannesburg to enroll at the University of Watersand, but was refused admission due to racial discrimination and the separate university's legislation, which prohibited most social contact between blacks and whites in terms of equal educational opportunities. He later led for the United States of America to study creative writing and education at Columbia University. On his return to South Africa, he published volumes of poems called Fire Flames, which was banned by the government at that time because the poems were protest poems against the unfair treatment meted out to blacks in South Africa. Oswald Michali is a poet who could adequately be described as a writer of protest and liberation poems. This poem was written at a time the white people ruled the country through a system called apartheid. Apartheid simply means separation in the African language. The laws of apartheid classified people into racial groups, that is, the whites and the blacks. Under this system, one skin color determined where he or she could live, the kind of job he or she could do and could not do, the type of education a person will receive. That appetite system prohibited more social contact between different races and denied black representation in government. The black population resorted to massive protests and showed their displeasure in Soweto and other black townships in South Africa. This led to the unlawful arrest and imprisonment of many freedom fighters since they were considered a threat to the apartheid system. Prominent among the nationalists who were arrested is the late statesman Nelson Mandela. From the ongoing discussion, we can confidently say that the background of the poem can be traceable to the colonial rule and the apartheid system. Let's begin our analysis of the poem with a title. Ninth Fall in Soweto. Soweto is an acronym for Southwest Township. S O for South, W E for West, T O for Township. Soweto holds a large number of slum dwellers in South Africa. The title of the poem quickly informs readers of the subject matter of the poem. The title informs readers that. The poem is a story of how a night in Soweto looks like. However, the poem paints a dreadful and scary picture of South Africa, specifically Soweto, a black township in South Africa where there was massive discontentment and protest against colonial rule and the apartheid system. The use of nights in the poem is most appropriate for the subject matter and the overall meaning of the poem being discussed. This is so because night is a time characterized by terror, fear, and insecurity. The entire poem is about violence and bloodshed since the speaker speaks of dreaded, disease, ravaging, murder, dagger, slaughtered, beast, and death. Nightfall in Soweto is a lyrical poem written in three verse. The poem is divided into six stanzas with an equal lines. Stanza 1. 
Nightfall comes like a dreaded disease, seeping through the pores of a healthy body and ravaging it beyond repair. The point begins as point, Nightfall in Soweto, by comparing Nightfall with the use of simile to a dreaded disease which is capable of destroying a body beyond repair. Let's break down some of the words in this stanza for easy understanding. Dreaded means carrying great fear or anxiety. Pores are the small holes in your skin that sweat pass through. Ravaging, on the other hand, means to destroy something or damage something badly. The opening lines of the poem informs readers that a night fall in Soweto is not the usual night which is characterized by relaxation, rest, peace, and stillness. No, that of Soweto is different. He compares the night in Soweto as a fearful disease that destroys its victim beyond repairs. Here again, night is personified by the poet by giving it human attributes of attacking or invading its victim. The disease seeping through the body suggests great pain and deadly pain. Night 4 is personified as an invader or an attacker of the body or its victim, leaving the victim completely destroyed. A murderous hand lurking in the shadow, clasping the dagger, strikes down the helpless victim. Here again, we come across some scary lines. The word lurking means to wait patiently in secret to either attack someone or destroy something, or to do something bad. This line exposes the grim experience of death and pain. The oppressor in the poem uses nine to attack the victim in different ways. Here, nine comes like a murderer this time with a dagger and strikes down the helpless victim. What this simply means is that whatever form night comes in Soweto, its main goal is to destroy people. First, night fall comes like a dreaded disease, destroying the victim beyond repair. Next, it came like a murderer, striking down its helpless victim. The poet equally stresses on the vulnerability of the victim through a carefully selected word, helpless. The oppressor in this case seemed more powerful than the victim, making him helpless. I am the victim. I am slaughtered every night in the street. I am covered by the fear, yawning at my timid heart. In my helplessness, I languish. The word languish in this point means to remain in a difficult situation for a long time. This line shows the pervasiveness of violence and the ceaseless harm caused to the victim. The poetic persona admits the effect of all the violence, brutality, pain, and panic. He is engulfed with fear and remains helpless for a long time. This line are a political satire aimed at ridiculing the Africans who sat down and allowed themselves to be cowed by the whites. The poet at this point makes mockery of his own people for their inability to fight and liberate themselves from the shackle of oppression, injustice, violence, panic, and racial discrimination. The poetic persona, in what seemed like his mocking the people of Soweto, for doing nothing about their situation and rather standing helpless with their timid hearts. The use of the word slaughtered by the poet suggests an animalistic way in which blacks in Soweto were treated by the whites. The poet does this by assuming the role of the victims who were slaughtered and the animalistic way the whites treated black lives in Soweto. The use of every night expresses the persistence of this fear and brutality. The black in Soweto fear every night in the street of Soweto 
since that can be the last night a person can see on earth. Man has ceased to be man. Man has become beast. Man has become prey. I am the prey. I am the quarry to be run down. This line brings out the persona's idea about man. The persona used man in this line to mean different things. Man has ceased to be man. In this line, the persona thinks about the animalistic way the black folks were treated during the apartheid regime. The black race was dehumanized and brought down to nothing. Therefore, they ceased to be humans since the whites were insensitive to black lives. Man has become beast. This line compares the white man to a beast, considering their harsh rules and insensitivity towards the people of Soweto and South Africa at large. Man has become prey. What this simply means is that the blacks are being reduced to a prey by the whites, waiting to be devoured or destroyed by the predator anytime soon. I am the prey. Here, our poetic speaker represents all Africans in the apartheid regime and declares that blacks in Soweto and for that matter South Africa are all praised awaiting the predator to attack them. Here again, the poetic speaker brings to mind the changes that have occurred to the human race. We no longer saw one another as brothers and sisters. Men have assumed the role of prey and predator, hunting one another down. This line brings out the beastly side of humans. By the marauding beast, let loose by cruel nightfall from his cage of death. Here, the poetic persona informs us that the oppressor only attacks at night. The marauding beast is a symbol of the assassin or the law enforcers who are out on the street of Soweto to destroy life. The law enforcers never took men in broad daylight. They came searching for blacks to kill them. The word marauding means searching for someone to kill or destroy. They came searching for their victims in the night, as if unleashed by the night itself from its cage of death. The night seems to be a conspirator or a supporter of this brutality, as it offers the appropriate atmosphere to carry out the heinous activities. Where is my refuge? Where am I safe? Not in my matchbox house. Where I barricade myself against nightfall. A refuge is a place for protection from danger and trouble. We all will agree that the home is the best place for protection. However, that is not so in Soweto. The poet in his helpless situation thinks the home is no longer safe for him. He uses a rhetorical question in this regard. The poetic speaker describes his home as a matchbox. This best describes the slums in Soweto and the level of deprivation in the area. However, it is interesting to note that this matchbox houses in Soweto contrast sharply with that of the mansions of the wives, since they enjoy good living conditions, good education, and are not restricted in any way. The apartheid system was a harsh system which put blacks at a disadvantage, whilst the white flourished in their endeavors. Therefore, this match house box cannot offer proper protection to black lives. I tremble at his crunching footsteps. I quit at his deafening knocks at my door. Open now, he barks like a rabid dog, thirsty for my blood. The poet presents the readers with a vivid image of what happens in Soweto at night and how the black lives are terrorized by the law enforcers. Even if you seek refuge in your room, 
the oppressor will march to your doorstep with loud knocks on your door, ordering the victim to come out and face their death. The poetic speaker, with the help of simile, captures the desperate quest of the oppressor to kill the victim. In the line, open up, he barked like a rabid dog, thirsty for my blood. A rabid dog is a mad dog that yearns to kill the victim. Nightfall, Nightfall, you are my mortal enemy. But why were you ever created? Why can't it be daytime? Daytime forevermore. In the last stanza of the poem, the poetic persona declares Nightfall as his mortal enemy. He can't seem to understand why Nightfall should be a time when different types of crime are masterfully and tactically carried out. Nightfall calls the lives of blacks in South Africa to ransom. Hence, they prefer daytime all the time, 24-7 of daytime without night. They never want to see nightfall again. Daytime in this line is symbolic and not just the daytime we know. Daytime represents brighter days and blissful days free from appetite, colonization, discrimination, oppression, and violence. Nightfall in Soweto symbolizes the apartheid regime of South Africa and the fight for freedom. The major themes of the poem include the following. Brutality, fear and panic, violence, racial discrimination, helplessness, lamentation. Davis Rubadiri was born on 19 July 1930. He was a Malawian diplomat, playwright, novelist, and poet. David Rubadiri ranked as one of Africa's most widely anthologized and celebrated poets. He attended King's College in Uganda and then Makerere University in Kampala, where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in English literature and history. Some of his works include the following Poems from East Africa in 1971, No Bright Prize in 1967, Come to Tea in 1965, and An African Tender Storm. Have you ever run back into your room after hearing the furious sounds of the tender? Well, this is expected of anyone who loves his or her life. Tender in the African society. Is associated with evil. Therefore, people run away from it in order not to be carried away by this powerful force of nature. The title of the poem, An African Tender Storm, quickly informs readers of the setting of the poem. The poem has a setting in an African environment and one can confidently say in a rainy season. Usually, during the rainy season, the coming of the rain is announced by pearls of tender storms and in most cases, the tender destroys anything that acts as an obstacle on its way. An African tender storm is purely a descriptive point in which imagery is used to present a realistic picture of an event and not necessarily conveying a moral message. The power and value of this poem lies in how vividly it conveys its message to the readers the poem basically describes the capability of a natural force, which is the tender storm, and its ability to inflict pain and destruction on humanity and other elements of nature. It further describes and delves deeper into the complete disorder and havoc which the tender storm inflicts on the people. An African Tender Storm by David Rubadiri is in three parts. The first nine lines of the poem, which begins with, from the west, and ends with, like a madman chasing nothing, are grouped together as one part. The second part of the poem comprises six lines, beginning with the line, pregnant clouds, 
and concluding with the line, and trees bend to let it pass. The third and final part of the poem starts with the line in the village and goes to the very end of the poem with the line and the pelting march of the storm. Let's now take a detailed analysis of the lines contained in the poem. From the west, clouds come hurrying with the wind, turning sharply, here and there, like a plague of locusts, whirling, tossing up things on his tail, like a madman chasing nothing. David Rubadiri opens his poem, an African tender storm, and ushers readers to the swift or quick movement of the cloud and the forming of the tender storm, even though the actions that happen in the poem are very quick. Our poetic speaker was able to capture everything from the beginning of the tender storm or the starting point of the tender storm, which is the west. We are told that the tender storm starts from the west. As the poem progresses, we are informed that the clouds come hurrying with the wind, turning sharply here and there. This line suggests a swift movement and the quick happening of the tender storms. We then come across the line like a plague of locusts. This line brings to mind the plague that was cast on Egypt by God due to Pharaoh's disobedience. Just as this plague was very destructive to the Egyptians, our poetic speaker, through the use of imagery, simile, and allusion, compares this suffering, pain, and destruction to that of what the tender storm leaves behind. The African tender storm comes like a contagious disease and causes a great deal of damage to the people. We also come across a line like a madman chasing nothing. Here again, our poetic speaker uses a simile to compare the aimlessness and the state of mind of a madman to that of the tender storm. The African tender storm is portrayed as an aimless destructive agent of nature. Again, we come across the line tossing up things on its tail. Here, this line suggests a destructive nature of the storm and its ability to destroy anything on its way. The poet establishes a rough rhythm and a series of patchy pictures which imitates the ragged turbulence of the storm. The wind is pictured like a creature rushing in and out and like a plague of locusts which leaves destruction and nothing to be desired. The word whirling which the poet used in the poem as part of the description of the wind creates a mental picture of a ferocious beast turning frantically this way and that way using a steel to toss things about. But on a more literal level, one imagines a ferocious whirlwind tossing things up as it spins. The chaos created by the wind is conveyed in the final image of this first part of the poem, like a madman chasing nothing. Even though the wind is presented to us in a swift and fast manner, but the swiftness and movement of the wind accomplishes nothing but havoc and disorder. Pregnant clouds rise stately on his back, gathering to perch on hills like black sinister wings. The wind whistles by and the trees bend to let it pass. Here again, our poetic speaker presents another stage or process in the formation of the tender storm. Here, the poet presents a vivid image of the elements of nature that come together to form a tender storm. Readers are able to see in the mind's eye the images of the pregnant clouds, hills, and the bending of the trees. The images we come across in this line suggest the threatening of a destructive storm. The pregnant clouds suggest what makes way for the tender storm or rain to fall. The force of the wind is so strong that it can destroy anything that stands on its way just as it is able to bend the trees. This part of the poem focuses a little more on the clouds. They are described as pregnant, that is, 
they carry rain and are also riding in style on the back of the wind. But suddenly, the clouds are seen as creatures with dark sinister wings gathering together to perch on the hills. And with this image, the poet gives the clouds a threatening aspect. They are like a swamp of dark flying creatures preparing to swoop on the people of the defenseless village. And all through this, the wind whistles by, bending the trees as it blows past. However, the poised image of the trees, politely bending to let the wind pass, is perhaps a little too fanciful, mild and serene for this poem, which is essentially about violence, destruction and havoc. The image seems to suggest that the trees are cooperating out of respect for the wind when indeed the wind is forcing them to bend. In the village, screams of delighted children toss and turn in the dying of whirling wind. This line seems completely different from the previous lines. While the previous lines focuses and brings images of sorrow, pain and destruction, this line brings to mind happiness, joy, and excitement. The movement of the storm progresses to the village scene where the children are described as being happy and in the mood of merriment. The children are jumping and jubilating. For the first time in the poem, the poet introduces us to human beings and how they behave as the storm bears down on their village. The children are screaming in delight and enjoying the confusing rough by the noisy wind and they themselves run around aimlessly, very much like the tender storm itself. The use of children by the poet is most appropriate for the subject matter being discussed as children are best known to be carefree and stress-free. This line suggests excitement in the midst of destruction. In spite of the destructive nature of the tender storm, it provides a good avenue for children to explore and enjoy themselves. What this line simply means is that nothing is absolutely good or bad. Your reaction to things makes them either good or bad. There are things happening in everyone's life, some of which are destructive, but at the same time, they provide opportunity for creativity and innovation. Inasmuch as these children are jubilating and excited, the poet cautions us on the destructive nature of the tender storm. Women, babies cling on their backs, dart about, in and out madly. The wind whistles by, whilst trees bend to let it pass. Here, there is a contrast between the feeling and emotions of the children and the women and their babies. This category of people are greatly affected by the tender storm. While the tender storm provides an opportunity for the children to celebrate, it brings destruction and mayhem to the women and their innocent babies strapped on their mother's back. Clothings were like tattered flags flying off to expose dangling breasts as fog blinding flashes rumble tremble and crack admits the smell of fire smoke and the pelting march of the storm. In these lines, we see the destructive wind flying off clothing and in the process exposes the dangling breasts of the women. The poet concludes the poem with images of flashing light, rumbling tender, and the smell of wood smoke as the rain beats down. The last four lines of the poem appeals vividly to the senses of sight, hearing, smell, and touch. Especially interesting in this regard is the sound effect in the line, rumble, tremble, and crack. Leopold Sigda Signal was born in 1906 in Joel of the Serere tribe in Senegal. He was the first African to attend Sorbonne University in France and later became a teacher there. He was a distinguished scholar, politician, philosopher, culture enthusiast, and poet. 
At his country's independence in 1960, he became Senegal's first president, a position he occupied until 1980 when he voluntarily gave up power. He died in 2001 at the age of 95. I Will Pronounce Your Name was published in a collection of poems, Shun the Umber, which means Songs from the Shadow. This poem is an example of Negritudian poem. Negritude was an ideology which aimed, among other things, to react against the cultural deprivation and Western cultural decadence that the black people experienced at the time the blacks went to Europe to study. Negritudian poems sought to revive through literature the cultural values and identity of the African continent and to praise the ancestral glories and beauty of Africa through the renunciation of whatever is Western. The ideology sought to emphasize on the value of the civilization of the African world and the contribution of the black race to human civilization. Negritudian points focuses on three main themes, which are the celebration of the dead ancestors of Africa, the celebration of black beauty, and the spirit of reconciliation. They equally criticize the Western civilization and its attendant effects on the African continent. This group of poets discusses the nostalgia for the past or the good old days, the glorify Africa, and have a firm belief in the future of the African continent. I will pronounce your name opens with an apostrophe, but uses imagery, personification, and praise words extensively to carry its message. The female character who is seen as an object of love, admiration, and adoration is called Nayat. Nayat is a princess of Elisa with overwhelming potentials who suffers the tragic fate of being banished from her own land. Our poetic speaker, Leopold Sida Signal, personifies the African continent as an African woman and for that matter, an African princess. She is called Nayat and then proceeds to paint a perfect picture of the African continent using the royalty, beauty, and undeniable characteristics of Nayat to describe the African continent. This point talks about the beauty of the African continent and culture, as well as the joy derived from being African and the pride in blackness. I will pronounce your name as by all standards a praise poem which celebrates and glorifies the beauty of the African continent using the beauty of an African princess called Nayat. Throughout the poem, our poetic speaker seems obsessed with Nayat and all that she has to offer. The speaker repeatedly makes reference to her adorable qualities and characteristics. One thing that is worth noting is that our poetic speaker did not directly mention the African continent in his poem. However, he makes a symbolic reference to the African continent through his choice of words. He uses words which are closely associated with the African continent and mostly used in describing the features of the African continent. This word includes savanna, midday sun, heat of the day, and the shining of coal to make reference to the African continent. Hence, the center of attention is on the African continent and not the woman or and not Nyad. However, the African continent was specified in Nyad by giving Africa human attributes. Therefore, Nyad in this point represent the African continent and all the continent has to offer to human civilization. I will pronounce your name as a free verse and has no specific rhyme scheme. The poem has 10 lines of an equal length. Let's now take a detailed analysis of the lines contained in the poem. I will pronounce your name Nyad. I will declaim you Nyad. Let's start our analysis with the meaning of the word declaim. The word declaim means to utter or deliver words in a rhetorical manner or impassioned way as if to an audience. Some dictionaries define declaim as to speak boastfully of someone or to speak of someone in a boastful way. Dictionary.com defines the claim as to speak aloud in an oratorical manner or make a formal speech about someone or something. 
The poet opens his poem, I will pronounce your name, with a speaker vowing to declare Nayad. How does he intend to do so? Our poetic speaker in the opening lines emphatically expresses his readiness to immortalize Nayad through his poems. This poem stresses on the immortality of art and literature and the beauty of literature. This poem, I will pronounce your name, is studied by students all over the world. Hence, Nayad or the African continent has been immortalized by the poet. Even after the death of the poet, this poem, I will pronounce your name, is still studied and loved by many. Pronounce in this poem means to glorify or praise someone or something, and not necessarily to speak or mention. Nayad, your name is mild, like cinnamon. It is the fragrance in which the lemon grove sleeves. Here, our poetic speaker is presented as an obsessed lover of Nayad or the African continent, who gives a beautiful description of the African continent. The speaker in this line likens Nayad to some natural features of the African continent. He compares her to cinnamon. A cinnamon is an aromatic spice and fragrance. This comparison alone shows a strong love for the African continent despite the various rejection, discrimination, and prejudices the continent has received from the outside world. The poet does not only praise the African continent in this poem, he equally draws the world's attention to the African woman. This poem rejects the outside world's standards of beauty as they measure beauty in terms of the white woman alone and not that of the black woman. Nayad, your name is the sugared clarity of blooming coffee trees and it resembles a savanna that blows on forth under the masculine odors of the midday sun. The word odious means extremely difficult and involving a lot of effort. Here, the words we find are not as attractive as the ones in the previous lines. Our poetic speaker deliberately uses derogatory words and unattractive words to describe the African continent in a positive way. What this simply means is that our poetic speaker does not consider the perception of the world about Africa as important. Whatever the world has to say about Africa is not so much as important to him, and that cannot demean the African continent in any way or take away her underlining natural and blemished beauty, glory, and values. The description in these lines brings to mind the beautiful vegetative cover of the African continent, which is the savanna, and he compares Nyas to this beautiful and natural vegetative cover. We find something interesting in this line. Our poetic speaker uses one of the things the outside world considers bad about the African continent to praise the African continent or to describe the African continent in a beautiful or nice way. He uses something bad about Africa to paint a beautiful picture of the African continent through the woman called Nayat. The midday sun, no matter how hot the outside world considers it is, is not at all a bad thing. This midday sun, we are told, helps the coffee trees and savannah to blossom. Hence, what the outside world considers about the African continent is not so much of a bother to our poetic speaker, as he uses the bad things the outside world uses against the African continent to accentuate the beauty of the African continent. Name of dew, fresher than shadows of tamarind, fresher than even the short dusk when the heat of the day is silenced. Dew refers to the small drops of water that forms on the ground at night. Tamarind is an African tree on which small soft fruits with sticky brown skins grow. Dax, on the other hand, is a period of time at the end of day just before it gets dark. Here, Nayad is compared to the early morning dew. Not only that, he equally admits that even though the shadow of the tamarind tree is fresh, 
Nyad is fresher than that. Our poetic speaker did not stop there. He went on to tell us that Nyad is even fresher than the short dust. Let's try to imagine the coolness of the morning dew, the freshness of the shadow of the tamarind tree, and the lovely atmosphere at dusk. Beautiful, isn't it? Yet, our poetic speaker places Nyad on the pedestal higher than all these beautiful scenes he has mentioned. What this simply means is that Nyad is not only an object of beauty and admiration, she is also a symbol of power and aspiration. The next lines reveals it all. Nyad, that is the dry tornado, the hard clap of lightning. Nyad, coin of gold, shining coal, you are my ninth, my son. A tornado is a very strong wind that spins in circle and forms a funnel from the sky to the ground. They usually cause severe damage on the ground. A coal is a hard black substance consisting mainly of carbon that is dug from the ground and burned as fuel. As we said earlier, Nyad is not only an object of admiration and beauty, she is also a symbol of power and admiration. Some commentators describe this line as a negative part of Africa. However, the poet uses some of the things the outside world considers negative about the African continent to paint a perfect picture about the African continent through the beauty of Nyad. Through a careful selected choice of words, our poetic speaker presents Nyad as one who invokes strong power, a power that is likened to that of a tornado. Nyad is also a symbol of inspiration and aspiration as she inspires the poet to confess his love for her. And by so doing, our poetic speaker is indirectly praising and confessing his love for blackness and everything African, something the Western literature is silent about or has a negative perception about. However, our poetic speaker uses his poem to praise Africa and put Africa in a high pedestal. He equally compares Nyad to a coin of gold and shining coal. This presents Nyad as a person with great potentials, and by so doing, the African continent is one with great potentials. We all know the value of gold and the uses of coal. Therefore, the African continent is one that has a lot of potentials and a lot to offer to the human civilization. I am your hero, and now I have become your sorcerer in order to pronounce your name, Princess of Elisa, banished from Futa on the fateful day. In the concluding part of the poem, we see what the speaker's love for Africa has done to him. His undeniable love transforms him to a sorcerer. A sorcerer is someone who performs magic, practices enchantments, and conjures spells. This line reveals the power of the African continent and how it inspires his citizens. Our poetic speaker considers himself as a hero and a sorcerer all thanks to the African continent. He calls Nyad with a different name. Nyad is the princess of Elisa who was banished from Futa on that fateful day. Futa is a West African kingdom and had its capital in Sfuta Jalong. The impression created by the speaker about Nyad is that of a superhuman who is worthy of the praise, adoration, and the love she receives from her obsessed lover. The name Nyad runs throughout the poem as if the speaker cannot talk without mentioning it. This goes to explain the speaker's obsession and deep love for the African continent. Africa is presented as a continent that has so much to offer to the world. Nyad met a tragic fate of being banished from her own land. 
Some of the natural resources the poet mentions ranges from the vegetation to mineral resources. Talk about cinnamon, lemon, mangrove, coffee, savanna, gold, and coal. Not only does the continent have a fair share of natural resources, they equally have a fair share of all manner of skilled personnel, including the poet Leopold Stider Signal. As he considers himself as a hero and a sorcerer who will pronounce Naya's name to the rest of the world, he is not only praising her, but also putting her on a high pedestal. The poet concludes his poem by telling us that he is a poet and he will use his poems to praise and glorify the African continent, thereby immortalizing the African continent and beauty. This poem glorifies the African continent and accentuates the pride in being black. And the Gabriel Okara is a Nigerian poet and novelist. He is a first modernist poet of Anglophone Africa. He is best known for his early experimental novel titled The Voice in 1964 and his award-winning poetry published in the Fisherman's Vocation in 1978. Some of his famous poems include the following, Piano and Drums, You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed, and Once Upon a Time. Most of his works focuses on the aftermath of the encounter between Africans and the Western world and the dilemma that the Africans are faced with. Once Upon a Time is a poem that consists of 43 lines that are separated into seven stanzas. The poem is a free verse since it has no specific rhyme scheme. Once Upon a Time is a poem that talks about the degeneration and demoralization of the modern world as a result of many social and cultural norms. The poem pictures a lively conversation between a father and his son. The poem, Once Upon a Time, presents the poet as a victim of societal changes which has made him to lose his real identity. The poet begins the poem as if he is telling an old story and remarks, Once Upon a Time, as a father, he makes us aware of the ancient values and beliefs and the falseness in the modern society since there's no connection between what people say and what they do. There's no connection in people's actions and their feelings. In stanza 1, 2 and 3, the poet tells his son about the behavior of people in the past and in the present which represent the good old days and the fake lifestyle in the modern society or the fake lifestyle or hypocrisy in the so-called modern society. He hammers on the point that, as a result of an advanced globalized world of social media and social networking, people have forgotten some simple and honest human feelings and relations. People have learned formal, polite and correct but meaningless behavior. Our poetic speaker remembers a time when people had true feelings for one another they will laugh from their hearts and meet one another with their new feelings. But this is not the same today. Our poetic speaker senses something different and something strange. People only smile and laugh, but they do not mean it. They only say or do things as a way of being nice and not because that is what they really feel. When they say, come again to a guest, they do not really mean it. They only say it as a way of being polite. They are only interested in meeting rich, powerful, and famous people. What's more, they have no regards for the poor whatsoever. In stanza 4 and 5, the boy tells his son that he has learned the ways of the modern society so well that his natural behavior is gradually fading away, and in everything he acts or they act in a manner which is considered appropriate for the situation and not because that is what they feel. He moves on to tell us that he has also learned to say things he does not mean since they are appropriate to say or do in that situation. 
In stanza 6 and 7, the poet expresses his burning desire to go back to his childhood innocence. It is clear from all indication that he is dissatisfied with the life that he lives now. He also thinks his son's genuine laughter can teach him to express his true feelings and emotions. He wants to get rid of the fake lifestyle surrounding the modern society and to relearn really how to behave in a natural way. This is possible only when he observes children and let their innocence and honesty be an example for him to follow. Let's now take a detailed analysis of the lines contained in the poem. Once upon a time, son, they used to laugh with their hearts and laugh with their eyes, but now they only laugh with their teeth, while their eyes block cold eyes, search behind my shadows. The poem begins with a line, once upon a time, as if the speaker is about to tell a story. It is clear from all indication that the poem is like a conversation between a father and a son. The father is presented as one who has learned a lot from the Western culture, which has changed his whole mindset. He sees himself as a different person now, one who has deviated from his true identity. The poet uses simple and everyday activities to describe to his son how he has deviated from the good old days, marked by simplicity and genuine feelings to a new advanced globalized and fake society marked by hypocrisy and people pretending to be who they are not. A society in which people hide their real emotions and feelings. The images we come across in this first stanza is that of greeting someone, welcoming someone, and saying goodbye to someone. Our poetic speaker recalls the time when people genuinely met one another with true emotions. However, such cannot be said about the 21st century or the modern society. In this day and age, people only greet, welcome, and goodbye others with fake smiles and with ulterior motives. The use of they in this poem represents Africans and how their lives have changed as a result of modernization, colonization, and the influences of the Western world. He moves on to give us examples in this regard. Our poetic speaker says that people only laugh with their teeth. Their eyes are like ice block. Here, what this simply means is that people are cold towards one another. He also brings to mind a true African home that warmly welcomes strangers. However, in this day and age, when Africans meet people, they search behind their shadows in an attempt to make sure they are the only people since they do not want to bear the cost or the pain of another guest or visitor. Cold eyes simply means emotionless eyes, eyes without pity, eyes without sympathy. Good riddance is a feeling of relief when an unwanted person leaves. There was a time indeed, they used to shake hands with their hearts, but that's gone, son. Now, they shake hands without hearts, while their left hands search my empty pockets. In the second stanza, our poetic speaker creates a contrast in the modern life as against the good old days. He also brings to our notice some of the hypocrisy in the so-called modern ways of modern society. He equally remembers a time they used to shake hands with their hearts. This is an expression of happiness and love. But he also tells his son that that is gone, son. What do we see today? People only greet, welcome, and goodbye others because they think that is the right thing to do or that is demanded of the situation. Inasmuch as people are not interested in meeting others, we find an irony in their behavior. Our poetic speaker satirically remarks that they search his empty pockets with their left hands. The message here is that people have ulterior motives for meeting others, or people have ulterior motives when they meet others. Instead of being glad and happy, 
These people tend to be more materialistic and selfish. They are more interested in what they stand to gain or what others have to offer to them. Therefore, their left hands search my empty pockets. Feel at home. Come again, they say. And when I come again, I feel at home once, twice. There will be no tries, for then I find doors shut on me. In the third stanza, our poetic speaker describes a funny incident that occurred with the speaker. Here, our speaker uses himself as an example and how he was treated by his relative. They warmly welcome him by saying, feel at home, the first time, the second time, but he tells us that there will be no tries, for then he finds the door shut on him. Here, the images we come across as that of people telling someone, feel at home, and when the person is about to leave, his relative will tell him, come again for a visit. However, his frequent visits annoy them as he finds the doors closed at him. This is true and this is real. When you visit people so often, you annoy them with your presence. Therefore, you will find the doors shut on you. These images contrast sharply with a typical African home where people are excited to welcome visitors into their houses. So, I have learned many things, son. I have learned to wear my faces like dresses, home face, office face, street face, host face, cocktail face, with all their conforming smiles, like a fixed portrait smile. Here, our poetic speaker admits that he has also learned something from the Western world which includes imitating others. He has faces for every situation. He changes his faces like dresses, a face for the home. He has a face for the office, a face for the street, a face to be a host. He has cocktail faces and all these faces come with their conforming smiles, like a fixed portrait smile. Our poetic speaker then talks about how he himself now wears faces like dresses. He puts on different faces and facial expressions which are considered appropriate for the situation like office face, street face, horse face, and cocktail face. The expression of people contrasts sharply with what they display in public places like offices, streets, markets, etc. And I have learned to, to laugh with only my teeth and shake hands without my heart. I have also learned to say goodbye when I mean good riddance, to say glad to meet you without being glad and to say it's been nice talking to you after being bored. In stanza five, the idea of smiling with the sea and shaking hands with the heart reappears in this stanza, but in a different context. In the opening lines of the poem, the speaker was vehemently against such hypocrisy and hence criticized such attitudes. However, in this stanza, our poetic speaker has given up criticizing it and adopted or imitated it. He smiles by showing or showcasing his teeth and shake hands just for the sake of it or just because it is appropriate in that situation and not because he really means it. He has learned to say goodbye when indeed he means good riddance. Good riddance simply means a sign of relief when an unwanted person leaves you. He has also learned to say glad to meet you without being glad to do so and to say it's been nice talking to you after being bored of the conversation he has had with someone. He goes on to describe how well he has learned to hide his real emotions by saying things when he really doesn't mean it. He has also learned to say nice things when in reality he feels the opposite of what he has just said. He tells us that he has learned to say goodbye when indeed he wants to say good riddance. 
He has also mastered the art of saying glad to meet you, even if he is not glad to meet someone. In order not to display his real emotions, he says, it's been nice talking to you, when indeed it is not what he really feels. Imagine telling someone, it's been nice talking to you, after being bored talking to them. But believe me, son, I want to be what I used to be when I was like you. I want to unlearn all these mutant things. Most of all, I want to relearn how to laugh. For my laugh in the mirror only shows my teeth like a snake's bare fangs. Our poetic speaker in stanza 6 expresses the need to go back to the past and the simplicity associated with it. He wants to unlearn all these mutant things. What this simply means is that he wants to unlearn all those fake expressions that has killed the spirit of compassion and sympathy for one another. He expresses the desire to relearn that which he has abandoned. Thus, he wants to learn how to smile wholeheartedly. Now, when he looks at himself in the mirror, he finds only his teeth, like a snake's bare fangs. The snake bare fangs as a symbol of mischief and selfishness. So show me, son, how to laugh. Show me how I used to laugh and smile once upon a time when I was like you. In stanza 7, the speaker finds a source of innocence and simplicity in the sun. Hence, the sun is the best place to learn the good old days. Just as he was able to master and imitate the modern ways of doing things, he wants to unlearn them and learn innocence and simplicity in his son's genuine feelings. He tells his son to show him how to smile once upon a time when he used to be like a son. Thanks for watching this video. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and share this video.